Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. And very excited to have you joining us for our biodiversity celebration. So yesterday was the International Day of Biodiversity. And with it being a holiday in Canada, we decided to put it off uh, so that we could have Canada and uh, classrooms in the U.S. joining us. So I'm going to introduce our guest today, Stephanie Arney. She's the first female host of the iconic Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. She's worked at leading zoos across the United States and worked with educational organizations in Japan, Thailand, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea. She's just launched the Creative Animal Foundation and has embarked on a year and a half long trip across the U.S. Uh, in her tiny house. And she's going to be stopping all over the place over this uh, adventure and looking for ways to promote sustainability and celebrating our amazing wildlife along the way. So um, it looks like, if I look across the bottom, that Stephanie has just dropped out of the call. So looks like we're going to have a minor technology blip to get things started. So we're just going to pause for a sec and see if she shoots me a message or jumps back in. But in the meantime, um, let's meet some of our classrooms because there's no point in uh, waiting with silence. So let me pop open my handy list. Mrs. Stephens group, grade five, joining us in Belmont in the United States. Let me turn your microphone on so you guys can say hi. There it is. How's it going, guys? Grade five. <laughs> All right, and then looks like Stephanie's back. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> My internet froze. Sorry about that. Okay, that's okay. Very good. You you missed your intro, and it was the best one I've ever done. So oh. you'll have to watch it afterwards. But it was really good. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All so right. That's okay. We're happy to have you. You've been introduced. We met one classroom while we were waiting, but um, I'll introduce them again. Um, but I'm excited to see what you're going to share with us today. Awesome. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Good. Good. It looks like we have six classrooms, K through sixth grade, right? Yeah. yeah. Just give me a big thumbs up. Yeah. Technology is so cool. <laughs> Talking to you from all over the country. That's awesome. All right. Well, once again, my name is Stephanie, and I am a host of an animal show, and I'm an explorer, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my life working all over the planet with different species of animals and how I've come to really appreciate biodiversity on this incredible International Day of Biodiversity. So I am gonna go ahead and share my screen and hopefully we do it right. Come here. Can you see everything, Joe? Looks good. All right, I'm gonna do this quickly so that everybody uh, has the opportunity to ask questions. But once again, this is me and that big animal in there. That is a manatee down in Florida and they uh, have been messing around with them on the endangered species list. Um, I think now they have um, become vulnerable, which means that there's been a lot of good work to help protecting them because they're a very important species. Okay, so this is a little bit about my story. I was born and raised in most of my childhood in Iowa, and it wasn't until I was 23 that I got the opportunity to go to Africa, and Africa changed my entire life. I fell in love with the people, the culture, the language, the food, and of course, the biodiversity. There's so many incredible animals in Africa, but I know that you're not looking at a picture of an animal, uh, of, a, uh, of like an animal, you're looking at a human animal right now. And I have her up there because she helped change my perspective. And, you know, like I said, it was my first time out of the country and I had certain ideas of how the world worked and how people connected with animals. And I had an idea of what I thought being popular was and being rich was and what being happy was. And it wasn't until I met this woman that I was like, wow, okay, I have this all wrong. I went into her village and I was interviewing the people about how they grow their food and how they um, work with their goats and their cows. And I was just wanting to know more about her relationship with nature and animals. And I don't 
know if I, I must have sounded a little snotty because eventually after me asking her questions, I think she got the idea that I felt sorry for her because I had a house, a big house at home and a lot of clothes and a lot of shoes and games and, you know, video games and all that. And I think I might have sounded like I felt bad for her. And she stopped me and said, you know what, child, we're all humans and we share this planet with the trees, the animals, and many different types of humans. And most of us don't have everything that you have in America. But guess what? You don't need all that stuff. And all of that stuff is actually hurting our oceans because every time you buy clothes and soap and candy and makeup and furniture, you're taking it from the planet to make it. And then you guys get bored of it and you just throw it away. And that makes me really sad. So here you're trying to feel sorry for me, but I feel sorry for you. And it was very, uh, a very eye-opening experience for me because this woman lived in a mud hut and had only two goats and two bowls and you know, only a couple pairs of clothes. And yet she felt, she felt sorry for me because she said that I would find my most happiness if I got in touch with nature and if I lived a life that didn't hurt all the plants and animals around me. And once I figured out how to do that, then I would be very happy and better connected to nature. And so she changed my life because after that, I decided to go back to America, the United States, and I wanted to work at, at as many zoos as possible to learn more about all the different species that existed all over the planet. So I got a chance to work at Omaha Zoo, San Diego Zoo, SeaWorld in San Diego, and the Honolulu Zoo. And while I worked there, I, I got to work with big mammals like giraffes and elephants. I got a chance to work and rescue uh, dolphins and sharks and birds and many other species, just like, like turtles. And then I started teaching. I started telling people stories and teaching at summer camps and at schools. And then I started going on TV and talking on the news a lot about how special animals are and what we could do to help them and make the planet healthier for both us and the animals. And I really loved what I did, but I still wanted to travel the world because I didn't just want to work uh, at an animal facility like a zoo or an aquarium or a rescue center, I wanted to explore the planet. So I saved a lot of money and I, by working at a lot of jobs, and I sold everything I owned because I didn't need it. And I bought a plane ticket to Australia. And while I was there, I got a chance to swim in the ocean as um, a dive guide. If you get a chance, please, please, please become a scuba diver. It is one of my most favorite things to do on the planet because it's a whole other world under the ocean. And it's extremely fascinating. To me, it's way more fun to watch than TV and movies and video games. You get to see all this really neat life from fish and turtles and sharks and dolphins and coral reef and how coral reef brings them all together. And in the process, I also learned about how the ocean is All right, looks like Stephanie may have paused on us with the technology. So we'll give her a second to see if she's able to pop back in. Wherever she's joining us from today, the internet must be blinking a little bit. Um, but I definitely Thank second. You. Oh, Stephanie, you back? Yes. Oh, we lost you for a sec. We lost audio. Oh, no. Where, did, okay. where did I lose you at? Uh, you were just talking about the Great Barrier Reef and how um, everybody should scuba dive. It's better than any TV show. And I yes. agree. Yes. Scuba diving changed my life. It helped me see so many different species of animals up close that I've never seen before in the wild. And I got to see how they interacted and helped each other and how they how predator and prey interacted. It, it was just amazing. I think the coral reef is one of the most beautiful things on our planet and it's just a world that I think everybody should experience. 
But I was also saying that there's some sad things going on too that's hurting all those animals. And a lot of it's our plastic pollution, our straws and bags and cups and bottles that we use only one time and then we throw it away. And unfortunately, not all of that makes it to the recycling center or the landfill. A lot of it does end up in the ocean and a lot of ocean animals are, are struggling because of it. So pollution is a big issue um, for our oceans right now. So not only was I learning incredibly beautiful and amazing things about the biodiversity in the ocean, but I was also learning a lot of hard things as well. I got a chance to travel across Australia and do a really cool job where I took 10 people out, uh, 10 to 20 people out every day to swim with the incredibly large fish, the whale shark. And whale sharks, as we know, is probably is definitely the biggest shark in the ocean. And they can get very, very large. And so I would swim with them and I would try to keep up, even though they're big and they swim slowly, because they're so big, as a human, we're not necessarily designed um, and built to, to swim as fast as them. So we always had to swim really fast to keep up with them. In that picture, you can see I'm holding a camera because I'm learning how to take pictures and underwater um, film of, of animals. And we were also studying them. We wanted to know more about how they moved and how deep they could dive and how they ate and how they would breed and, and what they were struggling with. Were they struggling with plastic pollution too? Were they struggling with other types of pollution? And that's when we started finding out that that's, we learned a lot about shark finning. And I know this sounds scary, but it's, you know, instead of fishing and eating the whole fish, what happens is that people catch the shark and they just cut off the fins and they leave the rest of the shark. They just waste it and just take the, the fins. And so we're trying to learn more about how to stop that from happening. After Australia, I, I flew up to Borneo. And while I was there, I got to do a little bit of work with weird looking monkeys called proboscis monkeys. They have a weird nose. And when they're trying to call at each other, they go meh, meh, and their little nose lifts up. It's really funny. Um, so here's me contemplating life with a proboscis monkey. And uh, on the bottom picture, I was doing some work with some sea turtles. And what's happening with sea turtles, besides you know confusing plastic bags as jellyfish and, and choking on them, there are also uh, a lot of people dig them up to try to eat their eggs and i know you might be thinking oh gross or that's mean but there's people that eat different foods all over the world and it doesn't mean the foods that you eat is the right and they're wrong or we all eat different things to survive the only problem is that sometimes humans take too much because we get a bit greedy and we humans were taking too many of the baby uh of the sea turtle eggs to eat and then seabirds and other large animals were eating them. And they were having a hard time hatching and getting out of the ocean for a fighting chance. And so there's places all over the world where people will take out the eggs and put them in a new nest that's safe from all predators. And so here, these two baby sea turtles had just hatched. And humans um, will also take the baby sea turtles and put them right next to the ocean at dark time. Um, when the moon's starting to come up so that the sea turtles can get a little bit of a fighting chance instead of having to crawl from the nest all the way across the beach to the ocean. Because otherwise they would have to wait, watch out for all the birds and stuff. So we helped them get right next to the ocean. After working in Borneo, I got a chance to work at, on a sailboat in Papua New Guinea. And that was doing a little bit more work with um, coral reefs and sharks and turtles. We are trying to learn if all of the reefs around the ocean in that space, if they were healthy, were they dying? Why do you think they were dying? And then we started pulling up to random islands and just meeting all of the villagers and saying hi and getting to know them. But then we would sit down and talk about what's happening in our oceans. They wanted to know, why are we running out of fish in the oceans? We used to fish 10 years ago, five years ago, and there was a lot more. And now it seems like there's not very many left. You know, not a lot of, you know, most of them don't have phones. They don't have internet. Um, you know, they, they don't know what's going on in the rest of the world. So we were able to tell them 
that unfortunately humans are taking way more fish than they should be. And once again, we're getting a bit greedy and they were noticing. And you know what I thought was really cool is the first thing they said is, oh, what can we do to help? Even though they weren't the part of the problem, they only fished only what they needed for their villages, but they still wanted to help because they knew how important it was to keep all different types of animal species healthy and, and plentiful on our planet. And I thought that was really cool. After a year and a half before going back to the US, I decided to stop in New Zealand because I heard that there was a really big oil spill. So sometimes ships move our oil from country to country all over the planet and accidents happen. Sometimes ships crash um, or they get holes in them and they leak oil everywhere. And remember, we use oil to make gas, you know, fuel for our cars, planes, trains. Uh, we use it to make plastic. We use oil, whether people like it or not, we use oil for a lot of stuff. And when accidents happen, that oil can be very harmful to humans and to animals. And in this case, we were surrounded by baby, um, sorry, uh, uh, fairy penguins. And fairy penguins, or little blue penguins, in New Zealand live right on the edge of the water. And so the waves were crashing with oil all over them. So what we did is we rescued hundreds of penguins and other sea animals and we brought them to a rescue facility where we could clean them off with soap and help feed them and make sure that they were clean and healthy. And that funny picture on the right, I was making a fish slushy. So I grinded up a bunch of fish in a smoothie maker. I'm pretending to eat it, but I didn't eat it. <laughs> we just put them in um, some uh, tools so that we could get it down into the penguin's throat so that they for sure ate when they were feeling sick. <clears throat> After two years of traveling all over Australasia, I decided to come back to the United States and I had learned a lot about many different species of animals and I helped with a lot of different conservation projects, but I also saw a lot of really sad things as you've heard and I wanted to know how to make it better. And I, and I learned that just complaining about it or being angry about it um, wasn't always gonna be helpful. I wanted to learn more about how to make a difference. And so while I was there, I learned um, more about how humans are connected to animals like sharks and how that's connected to our government and our political system and how it's connected to the economy and with our money and how we spend our money and how it's connected to um, how we recycle and rent and work with all of our processes. I just wanted to know the whole big picture of why certain decisions were made. But why do we use oil or why do we cut off shark's fins. You know, why are we taking too many fish? Is it to feed the hungry? Is it because we're greedy? Is it because we have a law in place that's not protecting them? It looks like I we wanted just had to Stephanie's mic drop for a second. Story. I think that's really important. Give it a second. It came back last time. So and do scientific we'll research to learn both time. sides of the story before I came up with a conclusion of what I could do to help that would actually be very effective. Well, in the process, of learning, I started making videos to try to teach other people to research and learn the big part of the story as well. And in the process, I was discovered in a contest to become the new host of a show called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And Wild Kingdom was a show that was on when your grandparents were younger and they watched it all the time on TV, but now we've moved our show to being completely online. Here in this picture, I'm high-fiving cameraman and audio guy, Chris, and behind me is a bunch of American bison. So now I travel all around the world and I teach people about my stories and what I think is what we should do as humanity to make animals healthier and make humans healthier as well. So here's me speaking. I speak at a lot of schools and universities and museums and conferences, and it's really fun. I love teaching. But in the last, in the last year, I started a nonprofit called the Creative Animal Foundation, where I teach people all over the country about how to use your creativity to make the planet healthier. Because sadly, the United States wastes more water and plastic and energy more than any other country in the entire planet. And to me, that's really embarrassing. So I want people to understand 
how they can make a difference by cutting out single-use plastics and saving energy and water and how that could help increase biodiversity. And now that's my new house and that's where I travel around the country in my house to teach people how to live smaller. And people walk through it and they learn about what they can do to help out the species all over the planet by, by being living more sustainably. And I'm traveling all over the country to do that and when I'm not doing that, I'm on the computer talking to kids like you. The end. <laughs> All right, can you see me now? Stephanie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, let me just check with the classroom because I just lost your volume, but let me check with the classroom. Uh, Mrs. Schofield's class, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Can you hear Mrs. Schofield, Stephanie? Yeah, I can hear everybody. Oh, maybe it's just my... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, eh? Okay, well, you guys can still hear me, so that's good. So, Mrs. Schofield's class, they're joining us from, uh, let's see, from Lowell in the United States. They're a grade six class. Uh, go ahead with the question for Stephanie. Do we have a question? Oh, there's questions. We might get a turn. What's your question? How long has she been um, doing what she's how how long has she? Uh, good question. How, 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 how do you, what do you follow? <laughs> got a cap on. <laughs> Are they asking a question? I'm flying blind. My sound is completely our, gone. Our question was, how long have you been a professional biologist? I'll try and come back in. Okay, I've been working in the field of education and biology for about twelve years. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Our kids don't move much. <laughs> okay. I don't know if Joe well, is hearing everybody. So if he can't, Joe, if you want to go ahead and coordinate which class, we can hear each other. So if you want to pick the next class. Technology. <laughs> How about... How about somebody with the, the kids in the red shirt? Do we have a question from here? All right, Ryan, what would you like to ask? How do you travel? How do I travel? Well, it's very similar to how you would travel. I take trains and planes and cars. But when I travel to other countries, I have to take planes. I think we watch, oh, I don't know if my audio is on. Is that it for the class with the red shirts? Well, they watched a little video of you in your tiny house, and they're um, really, really interested in it. Yeah, so right now I live in the tiny house, and I, I pull it with the truck. I got the most eco deep truck. truck I could afford. <laughs> so that whole house is truck. All right, I think I'm back in with sound. Can you hear me? <laughs> All yeah. right, we've done two classes. It looks like Perfect. we have a couple more. We do. So I think you visited, that was a kindergarten class, uh, Ms. Truce's yeah. group. And did Mrs. Schofield get to ask her question? All right, well, let's visit another class. Mrs. Segrito, she's joining us from, let's see, there it is from Oakville, Ontario. She's with a grade four class. Let me turn your microphone on. Ow! There they are. Ow! Ow! Who took my chair? Yeah. 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 Okay, Alejandro, go ahead. What's your Ow! favorite animal? What is my favorite animal? You know, I get asked that all the time. And I would have to say, oh my goodness. Mm, I really, really love sharks. I think sharks are really fascinating, and I love that. I love that they're so misunderstood, and that because I've gotten a chance to swim and dive with them, that I've got to learn a little bit more about how special they are. And they're not as scary as people make them out to be. Um, so I just think that they're a very, very special creature, and they're incredibly important to keeping our oceans healthy because they eat all the sick and injured and diseased fish 
and animals and they make sure to keep everything clean in the ocean. It's a really important job. So a shark is my favorite, but I also really love goats. I don't know what it is. I just love goats. I think they're funny. <laughs> All right, okay. fair enough. Thank you very much. Um, let's see who have we visited. There we go. Um, Miss uh, Stefan's group is grade five. They're joining us from Belmont in the United States. Uh, your microphone is on. Dramatic pause. I know. Mrs. Stefan, can you hear us? They were there. They talked to me. They introduced themselves already. Um, okay. Well, Mrs. Stefan, try unmuting your microphone for me or typing your question in the chat sidebar if, if you're still there. Um, okay. Well, let's jump to our next class. We have Mrs. Lachance. Her group's joining us from Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. They're a group of grade sixes. And let me turn, I see you're in there twice, so I'll turn both mics on to make sure we get you one of those times. Um, um, what percent? What percent? What percent? <laughs> you hear that, so? <laughs> percent of, let's see, like, each year by, like, pollution and garbage. And what percent of what in the ocean is affected by garbage? What percentage of animals? Oh. Yeah, that, yes. But I know that there is, uh, for example, like 550 million uh, straws that are used every day in just America alone, and a large percentage of those end up in the ocean. We have seven. Have you ever heard of the Great Garbage Patch that's floating around in the ocean? There's seven of those. So a lot of ocean animals are really impacted by the amount of garbage. I would say, honestly, all ocean animals, 100% of ocean animals are impacted right now because of, of garbage and climate change. Yeah. I don't know the exact percentage, but maybe if I can find it. If anybody knows how to find that, that would be impressive. <laughs> Joe, you know? All right. I don't know offhand. Yeah. Um, but, hard to up, but I'd imagine pretty much every species. In some way or another, whether they eat something that ate the plastic or they got caught in it themselves, I'm sure it impacts at some level probably most species in the ocean. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, so we have another classroom to visit, but uh, it's definitely been a sound battle, but I think we're winning. We're getting, we're getting our questions in, so we must be winning. Um, Mrs. Scalziti, her group is a grade three class in Henderson in the United States. Let me turn your microphone on. Where's my little mouse? There we go. Your mic is on. We can hear you. Oh, oh, oh. Do you guys have a question? Uh, yes. Something happened. <laughs> Ask your question. Can you hear you? We can hear you guys. Can you still hear us? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Ava, ask your question. You. Ava, ask. What animals did you see in Australia? Oh, so many cool animals live in Australia. I, of course, saw koalas. Um, and remember, they're not koala bears. I don't know what people said that for the longest time because I think they thought they were bears. But they're just koalas. They're in the marsupial family, like a kangaroo because they have pouches. So uh, I saw kangaroos. I saw wallabies, koalas, monitor lizards, crocodiles. Uh, I saw... I saw... And then, of course, all the ocean animals that I've told you about. Pretty cool, huh? I think somebody else in a classroom also asked me, was I afraid of swimming with the whale sharks? I saw it uh, typed out. And no, I was never afraid of the whale sharks because they are gentle giants. 
They do not have super sharp teeth. Um, and they want to eat plankton and coral polyps and really small uh, fish that are swimming around in the ocean. So I was never afraid, but I don't swim close to them because they do have a big tail. And if they move that tail really fast and I'm next to it, then it could bump me underwater and that would not feel good. So I make sure to be safe when I'm around animals. All right, that question is from Mrs. Steffen's class. They're the class from Belmont in grade five. So I'm glad they were able to get their question across through the text. Um, Stephanie, as always, it's so great to have you joining us. I love hearing your stories um, and your travels. Where are you right now? I am currently in Washington, D.C. with our tiny house. I'm at a library right now so that I could get at least better internet than I was getting in my campground. And tonight, um, right when I'm done here, I'm heading over to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. And I'm gonna be meeting with Kirk Johnson, who's the director, and then I'm gonna go to a dinner with some people at Nat Geo. So I'm, I'm, it's been a very exciting life. <laughs> it sounds like a good time. I hope they let you into some of the collection. I know they have one of the best yes. biodiversity collections you could possibly come across. So I hope they let you check out some of their stuff. Yep, I'm going to behind the scenes to check out the biodiversity. I'm excited. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, Stephanie, again, thank you so much. Good luck on the rest of the tour coming up. I know we'll see you again soon. Um, I want to say thank you to the classrooms. I know this was challenging. A lot of um, mic issues and sound going out, so we'll definitely see if we can get to the bottom of that. But um, we pulled it off working together, so amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Uh, all right excellent so i'm going to turn on the microphones and um i'll let the classroom say goodbye and thank you and thanks for joining us and helping us celebrate biodiversity you're welcome thank you kids all right here come the microphones go ahead everybody turn them on maybe they won't turn on Thanks, nice everybody. You too. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Stephanie. We're signing off for today. All right.